I was 25 years old when I found out I had diabetes. I was devastated. Uh, when the doctor sent me in his office and told me that I was diabetic, I thought that that was a life sentence that I was going to basically die. Because everybody I knew had died from complications from diabetes. So I thought that that was going to soon happen to me. Changes in my lifestyle. Oh. I'm supposed to change my eating habits, exercise, and uh, take my medication. Because I, I just had to take more and more medication. More and more. After, you know, I started out with so many milligrams, and then they add something else, and then they come out with something else to add to that, and take more shots and more of this. And I just got really just got tired of taking all that medication and all those shots. Because I didn't like taking all those medications. I think I took like four medications of pills form. And then I went to the doctor and he told me that, well, I'll, you don't have to take all those pills. Just take one shot a day. And I'm thinking, just one shot a day. He said, take one shot a day in the morning and you're good for the rest of the day. Don't worry about nothing else. But that wasn't true. Well, I went back the next month. My blood sugar was still high. And he said, well, now you have to go to three shots a day. And I'm like, what? Three shots a day? You Wait, back up. You told me only one shot a day. But now it's only 30 days later, and now I'm going to three shots a day? And I'm wondering, what happened? I felt conned. My mother had diabetes. All my sisters had diabetes. But again, like it runs in the family, no one took care of themselves. I still saw them eating whatever they wanted to eat. And they were still living and being okay, so I figured I would do it too. So we were all in denial. And my sister said, oh, girl, don't worry about that. You'll be fine. Just take your medicine. You'll be fine. Apple juice and Doritos. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Another thing, I, I love Oreos. I'd eat Oreos. I'd grab a handful of Oreos and run out the door. For lunch, if I had time for lunch, I was in court or something, I'd grab a Snicker out the candy machine, crunch on that Snicker, and I was good to go. I was 25, I was footloose and fancy free. Do whatever I want to do, eat, drink, whatever I wanted to do, and I was fine. 40. And my toe uh, swole up and it was looking real ugly. So I thought I had a hangnail. So I went to the doctor and they told me, ma'am, your foot is infected. And I'm like, okay, so what y'all gonna do? He said, we're gonna have to take your toe. You see how it's dark around your toe? I said, yeah, that's just from the infection. He said, no, ma'am, your toe has died. And we're gonna have to take your toe. So I said, well, I want a second opinion. So another doctor came in. He said, well, I think I can save it. And I was like, okay. So he saved it. He did surgery on it. He saved it. But he says, well, your skin's not growing fast enough for me to cover it. There's not enough skin for me to cover it. So I'm going to send you to a plastic surgeon and the plastic surgeon put some pig skin on it and eventually saved it. That's the first toe that I had problems with. Then uh, a year later I had problems with my left foot big toe and that was the first one that I had amputated because pretty much the same thing happened. I didn't listen. I was still walking around in my heels and the pressure was on my toes and my shoes were squeezing my toe and it got infected. But this time, I guess my luck had ran out and they had to amputate my toe. The second toe, the one next to the big toe, that got amputated a year later after the first big toe. And then two years later, they amputated the other three. Um, sugar level was out of control. They couldn't control it. They just kept adding more medicine. Well, stop that. Take this. Try this. Try that. And it was it was just out of control. Oh, my blood pressure was extremely high, super high. Panicked and told me, Miss Miller, you got to go to the emergency. And I had a big event that next day, and I refused to go to the hospital. I said, I'm not going to the hospital. I'll be all right. I'm gonna go home, take my medicine. I'll be all right. I got up one morning and uh, I was nauseous and I started throwing up and I looked down at it and it had blood in it so I panicked and I called my husband and he came home 
And he saw the blood. He's like, yeah, for sure that's blood, Sonia. We got to go to the emergency room. So we went to the emergency room. And after them doing some other tests, they told me that um, it was probably my kidneys, that my body was emptying toxins out because my kidneys was basically shutting down on me and that I need to be admitted in the hospital. And at that time, I was still in emergency. It's a great possibility that I would need to get dialysis. And um, I thought that my life was over. I thought that I would be confined um, to my house or to a dialysis center going there for three days a week. And um, I have a four-year-old and um, I had life. I had a husband, four-year-old, full-time PhD student, um, a business, and I knew that that, that was going to have to change. I have to go to the center three times a week for a minimum of three to four hours, three times a week, or um, this dialysis machine in my house. That every night I had to be hooked up to this dialysis machine, which to me felt like I would have a leash around my neck every day because I couldn't be spontaneous and go out of town because I have to go and pack up this machine, put all this stuff in my car, make sure that the hotel or wherever I go had the proper outlets for my dialysis machine to work that night. I couldn't be spontaneous and get in my car and drive until the gas ran out. Everything in my life from then on out had to be planned around this dialysis machine. They told me it wasn't no way out of it. Point blank period. This is what you have to do if you want to live. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You done ran out of time. Your kidneys is failing you. And if you want to die, then leave here without consenting to dialysis. But if you consent to dialysis, you'll have a quality of life. But I'm thinking, what kind of quality of life am I going to have coming to a or going to a center three times a week or being tied to a dialysis machine in my house every single night. Well, they told me that it was inevitable, that I had to do it. But my mind immediately left me and went to my daughter. And I said to myself, I have to do this, not for you, Sonia, but for my daughter. I adopted my daughter at nine months old, and she had already lost a mother um, when she was born, her mother, Three months after she was born, her mother died from hemorrhaging. It was given to me as a gift from God, and I figured that I needed to stay here and take care of this gift and go ahead and do, put myself aside and go ahead and do this for her. So before I left, they pressured me into dialysis, and that was the final decision was to go ahead and do it because she had already lost one mother, and I couldn't stand it. Oh, <laughs> the journey I'm on now is a totally different road as far as my health is concerned. I've made a 360. I felt that I felt weak. I felt basically to sum up everything in a nutshell, hopeless. I felt hopeless. I felt like my back was against the wall. I had nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. I felt like I was trapped. My back was literally against the wall. They, my time had run out. I guess I was paying for all the things that I had done prior to that. And now it's time to pay the piper. And that's what I thought. This is consequences of all that stuff that you were doing, not eating right, not exercising, not taking medication, not doing, just doing what you want to do. And now it's time to pay the piper. So suck it up, Sonia. Pay the piper. You have people depending on you to do this. So you got to do it. And that's what I decided to do. Um, let's go ahead and go on dialysis until I met Miss Vicky. Um, 
at her place of business and um, I was looking up dialysis on my phone and she came and sat and was trying to talk to me but my mind was into my phone because I was trying to do all the research on dialysis and what it's going to take and what they'll have to give up and all the stuff that was entailed with that and she said you sure are into that phone I said yes ma'am the doctor just said that um, I'm gonna have to get dialysis she says no you don't I said yes ma'am I do I'm in stage five I do she said you want some help I said what are you talking about she said I know this doctor that can help you I said Miss Vicky I'm not trying to look for no hocus pocus no magic does. These people say I'm going to die if I don't get dialysis. And I believe her. She said, well, why don't you believe me? I said, because I've been promised a lot of things in the past that didn't come true. And I've run out of time. If I had time, Ms. Vicky, I'd try what you tell me to try. I don't have time. She said, well, call this man, Dr. Moore, and call him now. So she gave me the card, and I said, okay, I'll call him when I get home. Had no intention of doing it. And she said, no, you call him now. What you got to lose? Go on and call him now. He'll pick up the phone. And I'm thinking, okay, let me just go ahead and appease her. So I called him, called Dr. Moore, and he picked up the phone. And I told a little bit about my history and what I was up against, and I said, you know, I'm not looking for no hocus pocus, no magic dust. Miss Vicky said, hey, you can help me. And she asked me to give you a call. He came, got me on track. Um, I go in my doctor's office. Well, first I go to the lab two days prior to meeting her in the office to take the blood work. I get in her office, she calls me back. She looks at the lab work and she just gets silent. And so I'm waiting there for like maybe three, four minutes. She hadn't said a word. She's just looking. She's flipping through the pages and looking. So I'm sitting up here, I'm getting nervous. I'm thinking, oh Lord, she gonna say the same thing the other one said before. But she's not saying anything. But she's flipping through the pages and she's kind of had this frown on her face. So I'm thinking maybe she's thinking about she don't want to give me this bad news. So she looks at the blood work and she says, what are you taking? I said, I'm not taking anything. And she says, no, as far as medication is concerned, what are you taking? I said, and she says, uh, you're not taking your insulin? I said, no, ma'am. You're not taking your lisinopril? I said, no, ma'am. You're not taking your cholesterol medication? I said, no, ma'am. She said, what are you taking? I said, nothing. I'm not taking anything. So she looks over at my husband as though, tell me the truth. He says, she's telling you the truth. He's like, Miss Miller, I can't help you if I don't know what you're taking. I said, Doc, I'm not taking anything. She goes, well, what are you doing? I said, I've changed my lifestyle. And she goes, what do you mean by that? I said, I don't eat what I used to eat before. I cut out all the junk food. I don't eat the chip, potato chips. I don't eat potatoes. I don't eat bread. I don't eat uh, processed meats. I don't eat uh, pre-prepared foods. She goes, then what are you doing? I said, I prepare my own food. And she says, uh, okay. If that's your story and you're sticking to it, then go right ahead. But I'm not going to be able to help you till you decide to come out with the truth. I said, I'm telling you the truth. And she said, well, if that's your story and you want to stick to it, that's fine. 240 pounds. That was the heaviest I had ever been. So she was looking at the past records of 240 pounds versus when I stepped in her office and stepped on her scale, I was 175. Dr. Moore started telling me a lot of things that took place at the hospital about what the doctors had said and um, what they were going to do and what they didn't do. And he made a lot of sense. And um, 
he told me that they're going to put a port in you and three weeks later is when you're going to start the dialysis. And then I said, okay, three weeks. He said, you going to wait, you have to wait three weeks anyway. So why don't you give me those three weeks and follow my guidance for three weeks and then see what happens. And I'm thinking, well, I ain't got nothing to lose. I got three weeks to wait anyway. So, okay, I'll try it. If it's a hoax, okay, I'm back in the same place. But if it works, then this is something I can benefit from. So I decided to go ahead and give three weeks. Um, I started on a Tuesday, um, right after Memorial Day. The first day was really hard because my family and I had went on a vacation and um, the whole family was there and they're eating what they want to eat. And everybody's having fun with pizza night and ice cream and Mexican food. After all, you're in San Antonio, what else you want to eat? So um, I kept saying to myself, you got to live, you got to live. And I kept looking at my four-year-old and saying, you got to live. Although I wanted to eat those tacos, I wanted to eat those pizza, eat the pizza, everything was my favorite foods. After all, I was on vacation, so I had planned on splurging anyway. But I went to the grocery store and I got my green vegetables, my salad, and um, my broccoli and my celery and all the things that was on the list. And I'm sitting there eating my green vegetables and my husband looks over at me and he says, oh, just pretend that's pizza. And I'm thinking, my mind does not click like that. Just stop talking to me. <laughs> just stop talking. So my cousin, she came over and she said, well, just take one little bite. It's not going to hurt. I said, I can't do that. And I said, I just got on this new regimen and I got to stick to it. This is my life I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, okay, I'll start next week. I don't have time for next week. I got to do this, and I got to do it now, and I need y'all support. So one of my other cousins, she's like, okay, cool. We're going to support you. So they everybody grabbed a celery stick, and they just started chomping on the celery stick. It made me feel a lot better, and I felt that they were all in with me at that point. And... Um, for the next three or four days, you know, if they did eat pizza, oh, I'm gonna eat a salad too. Come on, we're gonna eat your salad with you. So I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. I felt that they were on the team with me. And um, they gave me motivation to keep this thing going. Even when I did see temptation, because temptation came a lot of times. And I have a sweet tooth. And I just thought I was going to die. My husband was eating a chocolate chip cookie, and I thought I was going to eat his elbow off. If I just wanted to just put my finger on the chocolate and taste it, that's all I wanted. He's like, no, can't do that. It's going to set you back. Don't do that. And Dr. Warren told me, just stick with it, stay with it, for just long enough for that to pass, and it'll pass. And it did. It passed. Now it's like a second nature to me. I think about it, don't get me wrong, I do think about it. Because I remember what chocolate chip cookies taste like. But I know that my life depends on it now. A chocolate chip cookie versus my life. A chocolate cookie doesn't even make sense to me. Today, I'm healthy. I don't weigh 240 pounds. I weigh 175 pounds. And um, I'm doing the uh, green shakes with the stevia. That stuff, I love it. Oh my God, that saved me. That saved me. That stevia is sweet. Especially when you haven't had sweets in about six weeks or so. You taste that stevia and you think, oh, this is heaven. Thank God, I think I can do this. I know I can do this. Now I got my second win. I'm good. Now people can eat around me and eat whatever they want to eat. I don't think about it. It doesn't even bother me. I can sit here and tell you one positive thing for sure, for sure. I'm not on dialysis. This time, had I not met Dr. Moore, this time, if I was sitting here talking to you, 
I would be sitting here on dialysis. But I am not on dialysis. I feel great. My energy level is up. I'm going to work every single day. I'm running around with my daughter without having to stop every 20 steps. Um, she want to go to the park. I said, okay, let's go. Whereas before, I was like, well, let mama take a nap first. And I go to the park, but I want to find me a bench where I can see her playing, not up there playing with her. If I can find a bench and sit on the bench, I'm good. She can stay there all day. But if there wasn't a bench available, 15, 20 minutes, we got to go. And that hurt my heart because my daughter wanted to stay, but I didn't have the stamina to stay. And she's four years old. She didn't understand that. Well, what's wrong, Mommy? Why can't we stay? We just got here. So I know, Papa, but Mommy don't feel good. And she used to say that all the time. When she see me slow down or sit down, you don't feel good, Mommy? I said, no, Mommy don't feel good. You sick again? I said, yes, Mommy, sick again. But now, she didn't even say that. Come on, mommy, let's go, let's go. I had high blood pressure since I was 25 years old. 25 years old, I've had high blood pressure since then. But after I start this new program, I don't call it a program, I call it a lifestyle change. I don't call it a diet, it's not a diet. Diets are temporary. This is a permanent lifestyle change for me. And since I started this new lifestyle change, there's two numbers I think I will remember for the rest of my life. 130 over 76. That's the lowest my blood pressure has ever, ever been since age 25. Here I am, 48 years old. And the doctor said 130 over 76. Nurse wanted to do it twice. She thought the machine was broken. She said, no, it's 130 over 76. I looked at my husband, I said, hallelujah. He's like, Sonia, that's the lowest your blood pressure ever be since I met you. I said, yeah. Absolutely, Ab absolutely. What you got to lose? Try it, what you got to lose? I had three weeks. I gave three weeks to this program, or to this lifestyle change, and here I am today, I'm not on dialysis. My blood sugar is 100 without any medication at all. My blood pressure is 130 over 76 without any medication at all. I'm not throwing up. I don't even have acid reflux anymore. I don't have the inflammation in my legs. I don't have the pain, the shooting pain in my feet from the neuropathy anymore. I don't have that. Be quite honest, I've got my life back and I'm enjoying it for a change. I'm enjoying it. And I'm doing what life is meant to do. Enjoy my family, run around with my daughter, hang out with my husband. He says, let's go here, let's go there. All I have to do is just pack an overnight bag and go. I don't have to pack that dialysis machine. I pack an overnight bag, throw a couple of clothes in the bag and we can go. That's freedom to me, that's life. That's what people live for, is to live their life. And now that I've done this lifestyle change, I'm living my life.